Welcome for round two. You heard two great talks. You're going to hear two more great talks coming up. But I want to make a comment to the students out there. One of the most important skills in life to learn is how to give a good talk. Uh, doesn't, you can know everything, but if you can't articulate it, it's going to be a problem. So watch what these people are doing. You're getting a great lesson in giving a presentation. And what made it so good? Why did you like it? And so on and so on, you know. And uh, th th they're among the best, so you're getting it from the best. So now let's go to the second half of the lecture. And it's a um, pleasure hearing the probing questions. I want to thank you for those of you who are asking questions. I'm sorry we can't uh, satisfy all the questioners. We can't get to everybody, but we'll try. And I continue, I encourage you to continue asking questions today and always, as they say. Our next Gilbert lecturer is Dr. Chathan Pandaraina. Chathan is a, 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 an associate professor uh, for the, uh, in the Wallace H. Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at Emory University and Georgia Institute of Technology, the two universities combined for this program. He directs the Systems Neural Energy Lab, whose, whose research sits at the intersection of artificial intelligence, neural engineering, and systems neuroscience, with dual goals of better understanding the nervous system and designing assistive, assistive devices for people with paralysis. Chathan received un his undergraduate degrees in computer engineering, physics, and science policy from North Carolina State University and his PhD in electrical engineering from Cornell University. Chathan will, will uh, uh, address us, will address new developments from artificial intelligence and recent advances in understanding brain function in his presentation, Machine Learning Algorithms for Neural Decoding. Please welcome Chathan Pandarena. if I can get this to work. Hmm. Not quite happy, I think. It's all right. We've got the old-fashioned way. OK. Hey, everybody. I am super excited to be here. It's really, really an honor. Um, you know, I don't, oh, thanks. I... It's all right. I can... Thank you. Yeah, so um, I just want to say, like, you know, this is my first time kind of being in the, in the middle of uh, a bunch of National Academy of Engineering uh, folks. And so I, just to give you all some perspective, you know, it took me a while to realize kind of the importance of, of mentorship in science and in my um, academic career. Um, not, not till I was a postdoc did I really kind of get to see kind of the value of having a strong mentor. And, you know, I was just thinking, like, last night I was at dinner with some of these folks and really intimidated because, I mean, these are all the people that have done what you want to do with your career. And then it turns out they're also just, like, the nicest people. And the reason they're here is because they care about the future of, of engineering and about, about you, about the future of our field, which, which is you. Um, so, you know, uh, don't, don't be afraid, um, you know, recognize the tremendous opportunity you have to um, connect with people that are really, you know, they could be doing whatever they want, but they're here because they care about the future of our field. So with that, let me tell you a little bit about um, our work to use artificial intelligence to power the next generation of what we call brain-computer interfaces. So what are brain-computer interfaces? So there, there are millions of people that have limited movement from conditions like spinal cord injury or stroke or neuromuscular disorder, disorders like ALS or Parkinson's or cerebral palsy. I'm just curious if you're comfortable, show of hands, 
How many people in the audience either know somebody, have a family member, a friend with a condition like this that causes some sort of paralysis? So a, a fair number of folks in this audience, and, and that makes you realize that it doesn't, I mean, it tremendously impacts these people's lives, but it impacts their family members too. I mean, um, you know, often uh, these people are reliant on caregivers for their basic needs, and it really take, it takes, I mean, it takes an entire toll. Um, definitely when my father was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and I saw his progression over time, it really kind of changed the course of my career. Okay, so what are brain-computer interfaces? Brain-computer interfaces are an approach to try to restore communication, mobility, and independence for people with paralysis. And the way this works is that we implant electrical sensors in parts of the brain that are responsible for movement, okay? And from these electrical sensors, we record electrical activity as people think about moving. So imagine that somebody can no longer communicate and they want to type out a message. Well, they can imagine writing out something with their hand and we can decode that. Or they can imagine reaching out and grabbing a cup of coffee and we can move a robotic arm. Or they can imagine speaking and we can translate that into speech. So it's a really, really exciting time for brain-computer interfaces. So on the academic side, you know, uh, research in universities, we've seen some amazing demonstrations. So here's uh, uh, my friend Rob, who's touching a robotic arm, and at the same time electrically stimulating this person who's paralyzed and can't actually feel his own hand, but he feels like somebody's touching his own fingers. Or some work from, uh, so this is from Pittsburgh, from Case Western, where they showed you can decode activity from the brain and move somebody's own arm by stimulating the muscles that cause arm movement. Some of my work from Stanford where we showed you could rapidly control a cursor on a computer screen much like you would point and click, like with your, with your mouse. More recent work showing that you could rapidly decode somebody's intention to write messages. And then some of the most exciting uh, that came out last year is showing that when somebody is attempting to speak, we can decode that and speak for them and give them a voice back. So this is a super exciting time, but also it's not just in academia anymore. So just in the last five or six years, there have just been a huge number of either established companies or startups that are looking to commercialize brain-computer interfaces as well. And uh, if anybody's paying attention to the news, there is a maybe controversial, maybe pretty cool announcement, depending on your views in the last couple of weeks. Anybody know what I'm talking about? A couple of people? Musk, yeah. So, uh, so Elon Musk is in this game too, and his company Neuralink just implanted their technology uh, for the first time in a person with paralysis. So yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting time to be in this space. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, brain-computer interfaces and how we can use artificial intelligence to make them better. So intracortical brain-computer interfaces give us access to neuron spiking activity. So what do I mean that, by that? So your brain is made up of billions of neurons, and the way your brain works is by these neurons communicating with each other. When they communicate with each other, they send these little electrical impulses between each other. These are called action potentials, or spikes. And we can implant these sensors into the brain. So there's a thumb in the background here to give you a sense of how big they are. They're actually pretty small. We can implant them into the brain, and each one of these little uh, tines here is an electrode that'll pick up voltages, right? So we get these voltages that represent these little blips tell you when one neuron is sending messages to a bunch of other neurons. And we can do uh, what, what we call signal processing to try to extract these little blips. And so if you looked and say like had a bunch of electrodes as a function of time, it would, it, the data that you're getting looks like these little blips, almost like a little binary code, zeros and ones, as these neurons communicate with each other. And so let me just show you what that looks like in real time. So this is a recording as a person imagines moving their arm. And what you'll see here are these little blips. Each one of these boxes represents one of those electrodes I was telling you about. And these little blips are the neurons talking to each other. 
as the person imagines moving their arm. And so the data that we get often looks like this, kind of electrodes by time. OK, so these neurons, these little, this binary code here, this actually represents thought. This represents the intention to move. But we have a decoding challenge. So we need to turn this into thought. We need to understand what it is the person wants to do just from these electrical impulses. So that's our decoding challenges. How do we do this? And how do we do this on the fly, in real time, be able to respond to these types of signals? So before I get into that, I just want, I just want you guys to realize just how exciting of a time this is for you, OK? So this is a plot showing the number of neurons we can monitor as a function of time, OK? So somebody looked at a lot of the academic literature and said, how many neurons are people reporting that they can monitor? And you can see this kind of growth along the line. But sharp eyes will, will see that this is a log scale on the y-axis here. So can anybody just shout it out, tell me if you see a line uh, with a log y-axis, what does that represent? Exponential growth. So we talked about Moore's law for transistors earlier. That's what uh, Isabel was telling you about. This is Moore's law for the brain. So when I was a graduate student, you know, we were recording um, 100 neurons would be, would be a really good day. Now, I mean, this is a little old, but 1,000 neurons is, is pretty decent. And with technology like the stuff that Musk is developing, I mean, when you guys are, are getting done with undergrad, we'll probably be here. And that'll probably be 100,000. That could be a million. So the game is completely changing. I mean, I'd say when we were here, it's like we were trying to study the stars, and we didn't have a telescope, right? So now imagine that we're here. What kind of discoveries are we going to be able, or are you going to be able to make about the brain? OK? So our recording capacity, just like Moore's law, our recording capacity is at least doubling every six years, OK? And so we need new methods to help us understand these data. So what I'm going to show you about is a new scientific understanding of the brain, sorry, of the brain uh, that we call neural population dynamics. And population dynamics provides a new way to interpret movements. And I'll show you how we can combine artificial intelligence with this new scientific understanding of the brain to allow us to do high-performance decoding to power really high-performing brain-machine interfaces or brain-computer interfaces. And finally, I'll show you just a little bit about how we can combine these two things to also improve the robustness of these devices so they can last for really long periods of time. OK, so there's one kind of technical piece of this. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it. Um, and this is, this is an idea that changes in the firing rates of neurons are coordinated. What do I mean by that? So let's imagine, remember those, those little blips, those electrical impulses? Let's imagine you're recording those from three neurons, OK? Neuron one, neuron two, neuron three. So if I ask somebody to make a, make a movement and average the activity across many repeated attempts of that same movement, then those neurons' responses would kind of look like this, these, these smooth curves rather than these blips. And so one thing we often use in engineering is something called a state space diagram. Okay? That's where we plot the state of a system at different points in time. So we can think about the brain in the same way. This is a really simple example where we only have three neurons. But because we have three neurons, we can have three axes here. Neuron one, neuron two, and neuron three. So at any given point when we're observing the activity in the brain of, or in, with these three neurons, it's a point in our three-dimensional space. Okay. So all I want you to think about is we can go from you know, this activity of neurons to a three-dimensional space. And then you can look across time and trace out the activity in your state space. So the really cool thing that we found out in the last about 10 years now is that if you think about, you know, you have three neurons, you could imagine that activity could be in any part of this three-dimensional space. But that's actually not what happens. So if you observe the system over enough time, activity doesn't live anywhere in the three-dimensional space, but it's actually confined to what we'd call subspaces of the three-dimensional space. So if you have a three-dimensional space, 
a, sub, a lower dimensional uh, example of that would be a plane, right? A two-dimensional plane. So in our simple example, you could, you could have imagined activity could be anywhere in this sort of cube, but really just lives in this plane the whole time. And not just that, but activity doesn't just kind of randomly zip around in these planes, but there's very stereotyped ways to how activity evolves in time, too, okay? So we might see like very structured patterns in the activity and how it evolves in time. And this is what we call dynamics, okay? So these are dynamics in the brain. And I'm gonna put an equation up here. You can just completely ignore the equation. But all this is saying is that if you know what the system is doing right now, you can predict what it's gonna do in the future. And there are a lot of systems, you know, not just in the brain, in the world that act like this. You know, if you think about planets orbiting each other, they obey dynamics that are set up by gravity, right? So if you know kind of where two planets are, or sorry, if you know where a planet is and the sun, you know how fast it's moving, you know how far away it is, you can predict what it's gonna do in the future. And it turns out the brain works in very, very similar ways. It obeys rules. And so our job is to figure out what these, what these rules are. So let me give you an example. This is a study done, done by some friends um, back in 2010 where, um, sorry folks are uncomfortable with animal research, but they were working with monkeys and they were recording the activity of about 200 neurons um, as a monkey did a lot of arm movements. So I showed you an example with three neurons and then told you about how we uh, you know, could think of that as a 3D space. In this case, there are 200 neurons. So you can think of that as a 200 dimensional space. We can't possibly picture that. Uh, it doesn't matter how smart you are. You can't not picture a, two -dimensional, a 200 dimensional space. Um, so don't even try. But we can use various techniques to reduce the dimensionality of the data to just make ways of visualizing it, okay? So let me just tell you, so monkeys were making a lot of reaches in different directions, up, down to the left, down, down to the right, up here. And they were recording about 200 neurons from, from motor cortex. So remember, it, the data kind of looks like this, right? This like binary patterns from about 200 neurons over time. And what they found was if you do what I told you, if you, if you take the data and imagine a 200 dimensional space and reduce it down, find the plane in that 200 dimensional space. Uh, it's a lot like a 3D space, but just say 200 a bunch of times and it works out, it's fine. Okay, find the plane. So then what they, what they showed is that as the monkey reached in different directions, the monkey's doing all sorts of different things, the activity in the brain is actually doing something very, very similar which is kind of swirling in this little rotational pattern. And so this is kind of, um, if you kind of look underneath the patterns here, this is what I was talking about, dynamics, the rules that tell you if you're at a certain point in space, what's gonna happen over time. And here space just happens to be, you know, the activity of these 200 neurons. Okay, so what I wanna show you is that how artificial intelligence can use this concept of dynamics to improve brain-computer interfaces. Okay, so remember we were talking about these patterns and to kind of go from this really hard to understand binary code to these smooth patterns of what the neurons are doing, you have to average across many repeated movements. So if you think about what I wanna do, which is brain-computer interfaces, that's, so if, somebody has a stroke and they want to move a robotic arm, then we don't want them to have to make that movement 20 times or attempt that movement 20 times before we can move the arm. We have to be able to do it now, right? So we need to get these types of patterns from this, types of data, this type of data, and that's where artificial intelligence comes in. Okay, so what, what my colleagues did was, you know, all they did was just kind of average the data to get rid of this sort of noise and, and make it a lot, lot easier to understand. But we can't do that. So we use what are called sequential autoencoders. This is a type of neural network, okay? Um, you don't have to understand the details, I promise you. Uh, um, we can talk about them. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can do this. But we use something called recurrent neural networks. So this is a type of neural network. But let me just give you some intuition for how this works, okay? Let's imagine that you had a bunch of images. So when you take a, take a picture on your camera, you know, maybe it's a thousand by a thousand pixels. 
that's, that's a million pixels, right? So that's a million dimensional piece of data, okay? We want to find some way of compressing that down. So how would you do that with a neural network? Well, you could do that with two neural networks, okay? You could do that with a pair, and this is something called autoencoding, where you have one neural network called an encoder, and its job is to take this million dimensional image that you have and find some smaller representation of it. So find some limited set of numbers that describes a million possible numbers. And then you have a second network that we call the decoder that has to take that smaller representation and then figure out what the original image was. Okay, so this is kind of a new way of doing compression. Traditionally, there have been a lot of ways of doing compression, but now that we have neural networks, we can just tell them, all right, we have two networks, your job is to, like, network one, your job is to make the thing as small as possible. Network two, your job is to take what network one gave you and then figure out what the thing was. And we just train the networks for a very long time, and they figure out this process. And in doing so, they can learn the structure of the data. Okay, that's, that's really important. So concept here is something called an autoencoder, which finds a compressed representation of the data that best allows you to reconstruct that data. And this compression forces the network because it has to make a choice about what to keep, right? Out of those million dimensions, what information should I keep to pass on to the next network? It has to keep things that are important while discarding un unimportant features, uh, noise. So we're doing that with what are called recurrent neural networks because I told, I told you all that our data, there's this really important structure in time, and that's what we want to learn. So recurrent neural networks are just a particular type of neural network that happens to be really good at picking up on patterns in time, okay? So what I want to show you is that um, earlier, when, when folks you know, took this data from a, from a monkey making a bunch of reaches, and they found these swirly patterns, well, that wouldn't be good for us for brain-computer interfaces because they had to average over those many, many repeats. When we use this neural network approach, we can take the same data and now find those swirly patterns, but for individual movements. So there are 2,000 traces here. That's because the monkey made 2,000 movements. And we didn't tell the network what to look for. We just told it to learn the structure in the data. And this is what it came out with. And so why is that important? Is that just like a... a a pretty, well, it is a pretty picture. I, I think it's pretty. But is there more to it than that? Well, the reason it's important is because we can take this activity and we can try to figure out what the monkey or the human was trying to do. That's what we call decoding the movement. Okay, so if we took our old methods of doing that, so here's the monkey, you know, this is what its arm was doing on individual trials, reaching down into the right or reaching up into the left. If we took our old methods for decoding this from brain activity, this is kind of what we'd get. So you can see roughly the direction that the monkey was reaching in, but we're not getting the fine details right. But if we first pass this through a neural network and say, tell me what the important features of this data are, then you can see that we do a lot better. So now, it's not just like that. the general direction of the movement is captured, but actually the fine de details like the curves here. And if you're trying to control something in real time, like a robot or uh, a mouse or something, this, these details really, really matter. Okay, the last thing I want to show you about is, well, I'm going to tell you about a problem that we unfortunately have with these brain-computer interfaces and then how this type of understanding can be used to solve that problem. Okay, so one of the challenges, I told you about these sensors that we implant in the brain. And the sensors, you can imagine, like, here's a little electrical sensor, an electrode, and it's going to pick up electrical activity from the neurons around it, okay? And that's what these little blips that we're talking about are. Okay, so we do that, and then let's pretend that the person was trying to make movements in eight different directions, those are these colors here. So we've trained this beautiful decoding algorithm to tell us what the person is doing, and so we see, you know, these eight different directions. Well, the problem is maybe we come back the next day and all of a sudden, you know, the configuration has changed. So these electrodes are really stiff. The brain is like jelly. It's constantly moving every time you breathe with blood flow. It's, your brain's actually moving. 
and we have this stiff electrode in there. So unfortunately, that means that things are going to change over time. We're not going to be seeing the same neurons over day after day after day. So if we tried to use that same decoding algorithm to decode those eight movements, we would just kind of get this little ball of junk. And so what do we do? We'd have to you know, start over and train a new decoding algorithm. And uh, you know, systems just can't work. Uh, you know, they're not practical if you just have to uh, recalibrate them you know, every day or even every hour. But what we found was that if we can find these underlying patterns in the data, okay, if we can use artificial intelligence to find those underlying patterns, even if the specific neurons we're recording from change because the electrodes have moved uh, in the brain, the patterns underlying that data are still the same. Okay, that, that, um, that plane, those little swirly patterns in the plane, those are actually the same day over day over day. So we can then decode movements based on that representation and you know, just uh, skipping over some, some AI details right quick, we found that if we trained a decoder from neural activity on one day and then came back 95 days later, so three months, you know, if we use kind of standard algorithms, we would lose that structure. We wouldn't be able to decode it again. But using our methods, we start to see it come back. And this is without having to, you know, stop the device use and interrupt it to, to recalibrate. So you can kind of see how by, by latching onto that structure that's underneath the data, rather than the, you know, the individual neurons, um, we're able to make these things work much more robustly. So some quantification that you don't need to worry about, but just say that our stuff is better than some of the other stuff. <laughs> OK. There's one more thing that I just want to show you, because I'm really, really excited about it. So we've been. We've been uh, working to apply this. Now, so some folks asked me about uh, what, what's it going to take to get this in people. And actually, in December, at, at Emory and Georgia Tech, we um, implanted these devices into somebody with a stroke. Um, so let me show you. This is our participant, T16, in the BrainGate clinical trial. And as you can see here, this is very, very recent. But I wanted to show it to you because we're so excited about it. So T16. Um, she can still speak, but she has trouble speaking. Um, so it's really slow. It takes a lot of effort for her because she can't really control her diaphragm very well. She can't push air uh, through her, her vocal cords. Um, so you'll see we have, you can see this little black box here that's an amplifier. We've implanted these sensors into her brain, and we're reading out these signals. She'll try to talk. And you can actually hear her talk. Um, if you were having a conversation with her, it would be very hard for her. But you can hear her talk. And so you'll see kind of what we asked her to say. It's a little hard to hear um, the response that the computer spits out because it, she gets so excited that the computer got it right on the first try that uh, you'll actually hear more of her than you will the computer. But let me just show you. Wave man chomping. More my minutes. We get to her in five minutes. So the computer figured out that she was trying to say, we've That's been talking awesome. for five minutes. Now the prompt is, I think that it's what they want out of life. I think it's what they want out of life. I think it's what they want out of life. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So, yeah, we're really excited that this type of technology can, you know, out of the box make a potentially huge difference in somebody's life. And I think we're just scratching the surface of what these things can do. So, with that, thank you again. Uh, it's really a huge honor to be here. Thanks.
Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm Sophia Sevilla. I'm from Samueli Academy. And I had a question kind of revolving around the area of like dementia and Alzheimer's. I was wondering if this would have any implications in kind of encouraging thought and allowing them to like perform actions better. Yeah, that's a really, really great question. So, you know, I talked about applications for people with stroke or spinal cord injury, but there are a lot of other, you know, brain conditions. And wouldn't it be great if we had ways of, you know, helping folks with those conditions too? Um, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in Alzheimer's, um, but I have seen that people have been working on memory related prosthetics also. So we work on movement because it's often like pretty easy to understand. Like I can tell you to move to the right and I can know what's supposed to happen. But memory is this like, to me, much more complicated thing. But there are specific regions of the brain, especially one called the, the hippocampus, that deal with kind of um, uh, storing your memories and recalling your memories, where folks have found either uh, things like electrical stimulation of those areas can help boost memory. Or, you know, the dream is to be able to, like if somebody's hippocampus is not working well, if we kind of understand what the input is to it and we understand what the output is from it, then we could almost replace it with, you know, an artificial device. You know, we're honestly a long ways away and there are probably some other things that'll, that'll come online. But you're right. I mean, these ideas can help a lot of different conditions. And I think as we saw, like I showed you, the technology is really just taking off. And I think as we get you know, better and better tools, new applications like that should open up. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. Um, when talking about the encoder and the decoder, uh, in the hypothetical situation you gave with like the one million pieces of data or neurons, when you summarize it onto like a representative, albeit smaller set of data, there's going to be some data loss. Uh, my question is, is that data loss representative of human thought? Does it equate to it? And because we lose that data, are there some aspects of human thought we'll never be able to emulate until our technology advances enough where we don't even need the encoder or the decoder in the first place? Wow. I don't know. I don't know how y'all dealt with these questions. <laughs> these folks are pretty sharp. OK. Um, so yes, you got me. We're, we are throwing some stuff away, right? When we, when we take a million and we drop it down to, I don't know, 10, 100, you're going to throw some stuff away. And I think you're asking, like, how important is that stuff that we're throwing away? Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't even had the tools to be able to ask that question yet. Like, that's one of the big things we're kind of arguing about in neuroscience right now is, like, if you look at activity from a given area, just to, like, kind of hand wave, how many numbers do you need at any time point to represent the activity in that area? Um, and it probably, it's probably very different depending on where you are. If you're in, let's say, the visual cortex, which, you know, everything you, you see, kind of your visual cortex is responsible for representing that, that's a pretty high dimensional problem. Like, you know, think about dividing the visual world into pixels, it's huge. Whereas if you think about an area like I was talking about, which is like the motor cortex, that is much more about kind of control and doing things robustly and being tolerant to noise and perturbations, we think it's actually quite a bit lower dimensional. But honestly, we're not going to know the answer until we have better tools. So it's like I said, you know, we, we've been looking at the brain. It's like looking at, you know, stars without telescopes. And we're finally getting the telescopes now. Thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, just speaking of next generation, or say foreseeable future in your field, how much of it relies on accuracy of decision making by neural networks versus improving electrodes and hardware, and how much of it relies on human partnership in the whole process? So just to be sure I understand, when you say human partnership, you mean like with the person well, experts get involved in decision making by neural network. Ah, I see. Um, wow, that's a great question. So, um, you know, we have 
we have these artificial intelligence methods, we potentially have better hardware and better electrodes, and then we have kind of experts that can also contribute, you know, who, wh uh, who's doing what. I mean, I'm a believer that like, it's hard to, it's hard to argue with better data, right? Like you're, the best algorithm in the world is not gonna outcompete like having 10x better data. So I think, you know, these changes that we're seeing where people have new interfaces are really gonna make a tremendous difference. Um, I think we can't just trust that AI is gonna be able to kind of solve the problems for us. So I think about like, if you've, if you've watched the field of like self-driving cars over the past like, you know, five, 10 years, it's always been like right on the horizon. We're gonna have these self-driving cars. They're just gonna be able to do everything. But then there are these certain things that, you know, like taking a left turn on a crowded street that we still don't trust those self-driving cars for. And we don't know if it's like, do we just need better data or not? But right now, the best thing we can do is kind of write, like experts write better algorithms for dealing with that. And I think we're way behind self-driving cars <laughs> in brain computer interfaces. So I think for quite a while, you know, we're gonna need some of that expert input to figure out how to make these things work better. One more question. Uh, hello, I'm Alexander hey. Ripley. We spoke a little earlier. Uh, thank you for the amazing presentation. I just wanted to know, you said um, uh, someone was able to move an arm with just thinking about it. How can you differentiate uh, impulse and actually doing an action? Like if I just thought, oh, I want to grab this cup, but I didn't actually want to grab the cup. It was just an impulse. How would you differentiate the two? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. And that, so what you're saying is like, how, you know, when we're recording activity from the brain, how do we know when the person wants to do it or when they're just thinking about it? You know, like I can imagine, I can imagine reaching out and grabbing my water bottle right now. That doesn't mean I want to do it right now. And how do we tell the difference? Um, we definitely need, and the, the thing is, we can actually see both of those things. We can see, when the person is imagining, like we can tell people, uh, imagine moving your arm, but don't actually move it. And even though they're paralyzed, saying like, imagine moving your arm versus saying, attempt to move your arm creates different patterns of activity in the brain. We can even like, I can be standing in front of them and I can move my own arm and we can see patterns of activity in the brain that relate to that. So there's a lot here. It's not just like a, you know, simple, but, you know, you're, you're right, we have to be thinking about these things. We have to be kind of collecting data in these different conditions where our algorithms can help tell them apart. So, you know, explicitly say, okay, now try to move your arm versus now imagine moving your arm. Like, let's imagine uh, this case where we're recording activity when she's trying to talk. We might also record some activity when she's thinking about something, but she doesn't want to say it. And our algorithms have to be able to tell the difference between those two things for her own privacy. So that's a really big question in the field right now is how do we make sure that we can do exactly that? Great question. Good. We have a bonus question. <laughs> Hi. Hi, my name is Christina Perez. I'm a junior at Somali Academy and I wanted to thank you for being here today. Um, my question to you is that, is this resource available to people who don't speak English um, as well, or is it something that has it has been in the process of been, you know being made? That's a great question. Yeah, would so would would this kind of idea work for somebody that doesn't speak English? You know, I think it would work the same. Uh, you know, we we kind of um, like for example, I showed you uh, this example with the person who who does speak English, right? She she doesn't speak um, a different language, but the way we trained our algorithm is to ask her to try speaking a bunch of things. And then the algorithm kind of learned the relationship between the electrical activity we saw and what she was trying to say. But I don't think it really mattered that that was particularly English. Like we could, if she spoke Spanish, I think we could have done that for Spanish. If she spoke Hindi, I think we could have done that for that too, you know? Um, and it's all about kind of getting the right data. So that's a, that's a fantastic question. I think these algorithms will really be able to, you know, to work regardless of kind of the native language. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. Thank you.